tonight. Renewed alliances North Korea announces that the defense agreement between Russia encompasses provisions for mutual assistance using all available means in the event of an attack on either nation. Chaos Unleashed Continues heavy rainfall versus the flood situation in Bangladesh affecting nearly 1 million people throughout the country. Fatalities climb. A new tally reports today that the death toll due to the scorching heat from this year's Hajj exceeds 1000 with unregistered pilgrims making up more than half of those who perished among intense heat. And surprising revival. A pioneering initiative leads the way to reintroduce the Atlantic sturgeon in the largest river in Sweden. All that and more. As well news tonight starts right now. This is Ava Derna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Vinuth Warnasuria. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News. Some key stories are coming up tonight with the Russian president extending his visit to travels to Vietnam, concluding a successful visit in North Korea. Russian President Vladimir Putin and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un signed an agreement yesterday that pledges mutual aid if either country faces aggression, a strategic pact that comes as both face escalating standoffs with the West. Details of the deal were not immediately clear, but it could mark the strongest connection between Moscow and Pyongyang since the end of the Cold War. Both leaders described it as a major upgrade of their relations covering security, trade, investment, cultural and humanitarian ties. Putin has courted Kim with gifts of limousines and a tour of Russia's new space launch center, as well as steepening military cooperation, which has alarmed the United States and its Asian allies. Kim spoke at a rare press conference, announcing the signing of a comprehensive strategic partnership. Our two countries' relations have been elevated to the new higher level of an alliance, laying the legal groundwork for the grand ideas of leadership of the two countries and longing of our people to build a strong country while firmly protecting the peace and security in the region and the world in line with the common interest of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea and the Russian Federation. At the start of their summit, Kim expressed unconditional support for all of Russia's policies, including a full support and firm alliance for Putin's war with Ukraine. Russian media reported Putin said Moscow was fighting the hegemonic, imperialist policy of the United States and its allies. We highly appreciate your consistent and unwavering support for Russian policy, including the Ukrainian strand. I'm referring to our fight against the hegemonic policy imposed for decades, the imperialist policy of the United States and its satellites against the Russian Federation. This was Putin's first visit to North Korea in 24 years. He received a lavish welcome in Pyongyang. The visit will likely reshape decades of Russia-North Korea relations at a time when both face international isolation. Seoul and Washington are watching closely and have expressed concern about the two countries' growing military ties. The reaction from China, the North's main political and economic benefactor, and an increasingly important ally for Moscow has been muted. Russia has used its warming ties with North Korea to needle Washington while heavily sanctioned North Korea has won political backing and promises of economic support and trade from Moscow. The United States and its allies say they fear Russia could provide aid for North Korea's missile and nuclear programs, which are banned by UN Security Council resolutions. They have also accused Pyongyang of providing ballistic missiles and artillery shells that Russia has used in its war in Ukraine. Extending his visits, President Vladimir Putin was welcomed by Vietnam, highlighting its long-standing relationship with Moscow amid international scrutiny over Russia's actions in Ukraine. Putin arrived in Hanoi today following his visit to North Korea and Vietnam's neutrality on Ukraine is challenged by the U.S. Embassy's criticism of Putin's visit. President Vladimir Putin was welcomed yesterday in Vietnam with a 21-gun salute during a military ceremony as one of the communist-run country's top leaders hailed a comprehensive strategic partnership with Moscow and vowed to boost ties. 
Vietnamese President To Lam congratulated Putin on his re-election and praised Russia's achievements, including domestically political stability as the two met in Hanoi. Putin also paid a courtesy call on Vietnamese Prime Minister Pham Min Chin. During his state visit to Vietnam, Putin signed a series of agreements with Vietnamese President To Lam, emphasizing Moscow's efforts to strengthen ties in Asia amid increasing global isolation due to its military operations in Ukraine. One emphasizing fact is that Vietnam has remained neutral on Russia's invasion on Ukraine. But neutrality is getting trickier, with the U.S. Embassy in Hanoi criticizing Putin's visit to the country. Putin, who arrived in the early hours yesterday, is on the final stop of his two-nation tour of Asia after concluding a defense pact with North Korea. Bangladesh has seen a day of floods worsening in the northeast, marooning more than 825,000 in Salih district, while the north is under threat of flood and the southeastern coastal district have experienced deadly landslides. Relentless heavy rains and mountain runoff from India are expected to continue, fueling fears of the situation deteriorating further over the next two to three days. Just as Bangladesh recovers from Cyclone Ramal, which impacted 4.6 million people and destroyed 35,000 houses, the northeastern region has been hit by flash flooding. 1.25 million people have been affected, with more than 30,000 people seeking shelter, according to early estimates. The situation is predicted to worsen, with the weather department forecasting heavy rain till tomorrow. More than 370,000 people have been affected by the flood in Silet, Bangladesh's second largest city. This is the second wave of flooding in the region in the last 20 days. Water levels surpassed danger marks at six points along four rivers in Silet, according to the Water Development Board of Bangladesh. A power substation in the area is at risk, putting approximately 50,000 people at risk of losing electricity. The government of Bangladesh has opened 619 shelters in the region. With many roads submerged, it has become difficult for families to take the sick to hospitals, some of which have also been flooded. The crisis over a lack of drinking water and place to stay is deepening, forcing many to take shelter at flood centers. Over to the updates on the Israel-Palestine conflict now. The UN Human Rights Office says that Israeli forces may have repeatedly violated the laws of war and failed to distinguish between civilians and fighters in the Gaza war. Well, however, Israel criticized the report, saying it did not give due attention to the Hamas hostages. Separately, the head of a UN inquiry accused the Israeli military of carrying out the extermination of Palestinians. The UN Rights Office, or OHCHR, issued a report examining six Israeli attacks that caused many casualties and destroyed civilian infrastructure. This was its spokesperson, Jeremy Lawrence. It notes that unlawful targeting, when committed as part of a widespread or systematic attack against a civilian population, in line with the state or organisational policy, may also implicate the commission of crimes against humanity. Israel's permanent mission to the United Nations in Geneva characterised the analysis as factually, legally and methodologically flawed. It said the OHCHR had, at best, a partial factual picture. Lawrence said the attacks examined occurred before December, but were part of a continued pattern though it was getting harder to assess the situation on the ground as the war went on. In a separate meeting of the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva, the head of the UN Commission of Inquiry, Navi Pile, said perpetrators of abuses in the conflict must be brought to account. She repeated findings from a report published last week that both Hamas militants and Israel have committed war crimes. But she said Israel alone was responsible for the most serious abuses under international law, known as crimes against humanity. We conclude that Israeli authorities are responsible for war crimes, crimes against humanity and violations of international humanitarian and human rights law, including extermination, intentionally directing attacks against civilians and civilian objects, murder, or willful killing, using starvation as a method of war, forcible transfer, gender persecution targeting Palestinian men and boys, sexual and gender-based violence amounting to torture and cruel or inhuman treatment. 
Israel, which does not cooperate with the inquiry and alleges an anti-Israel bias, chose the mother of a hostage held by Hamas to speak on its behalf at the meeting. The international community must not allow political consideration to override our core human values. And it criticised the report on the grounds that it did not give due attention to the hostages taken by Hamas in its attack on southern Israel on October 7th. The Chinese Coast Guard yesterday defended its actions following a clash on Monday with the Philippines' Navy resupply ship that resulted in the collision between the two vessels. Manila accused the Chinese of aggressive behavior after several Filipino sailors were injured in the incident. Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson Lin Zhan said in a daily news briefing that the Chinese ship only took action because the Philippine ship was trespassing on the disputed second Thomas Shoal. Lin said the Chinese Coast Guard took no direct measures as it moved to stop an illegal supply mission by a Philippine vessel. Prior to the Chinese statement, the Philippine Navy said on Tuesday that one sailor suffered a serious injury after the Chinese Coast Guard ship conducted intentional high-speed ramming before aiming its weapons and pointing strobe lights to threaten and harass Filipino sailors. The Philippines Navy stated that continued aggressive behavior and unprofessional conduct towards a legitimate humanitarian mission was unacceptable. Time for a short commercial break. More world news coming on the other side. Welcome back. The reported death toll from the scorching heat in Saudi Arabia surged past 1,000 Hajj pilgrims as of the latest reports as friends and family search for missaved loved ones. An Arab diplomat told that media deaths among Egyptians alone had jumped to at least 600 from more than 300 a day earlier, passing the death count to almost 900, mostly from the unforgiving heat. Pilgrims desperately tried to cool off in the scorching heat. As one of the world's largest religious rituals, Hajj, winds down, bodies are being counted. Egyptian, Jordanian and other Arab officials have reported dozens of their citizens dead or missing after they made the pilgrimage to Mecca in Saudi Arabia. Yesterday we were on our way and we saw corpses along the road lying there covered with a sheet because the temperatures here are just so high. And I'm not talking just about old people, young people have died too. Around 1.8 million pilgrims took part in the Hajj this year, amid temperatures as high as 51 degrees Celsius in the shade at the Grand Mosque, according to Saudi officials. Many of the rituals involve being outdoors for hours in the daytime. Saudi authorities have reported treating pilgrims suffering from heat stress, but have not provided information on fatalities. We monitor the weather, we monitor the health of all uh, pilgrims 24-7 uh, from the moment they reach the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. We've reached more than 2,700 pilgrims who suffered from heat uh, illnesses, diseases. Deaths aren't uncommon at the Hajj, with stampedes and epidemics throughout its history. But it's also increasingly affected by climate change, according to a Saudi study published last month. Last year, at least 240 pilgrims were reported dead. On the road to the White House tonight, former President Donald Trump made a significant overture to Milwaukee on Tuesday, weeks before the city is set to host the Republican National Convention. Well, this comes after reports surface of Trump calling Wisconsin's largest city horrible during a closed-door meeting with the Republican House members. But yesterday at Wisconsin, he proclaimed that he loves Milwaukee, aiming to clear the air about his earlier remarks. His allies later clarified that Trump's criticism was not directed at issues, but it was directed at crime and water fraud rather than the city itself. In a bold move to secure support in the crucial swing state of Wisconsin, Trump expressed his admiration for Milwaukee, contrasting his earlier comments about the city. With the Republican National Convention approaching, the former president sought to mend fences at a rally in Racine, a city just 30 miles south of Milwaukee on the shores of Lake Michigan. Wisconsin remains a pivotal battleground state, essential for any candidate's path to victory in the upcoming presidential race. 
Trump's narrow win in the state in 2016 was a key factor in his election triumph. However, President Joe Biden reclaimed Wisconsin for the Democrats in 2020, making it a focal point for both parties in his election cycle. Trump's rally in Racine had the atmosphere of a quintessential small-town celebration. Moving to Africa now. South Africa's President Cyril Ramaphosa vowed to improve basic living conditions for all citizens as he was inaugurated yesterday at the head of a new power-sharing government. A weakened South African President Cyril Ramaphosa was sworn in for a second term in office on Wednesday. His party, the African National Congress, was humbled in a May 29th election and now shares power with five other parties. The President of the Republic of South Africa. At a ceremony in the capital Pretoria, Ramaphosa told crowds that the voice of the people had been heard. The people of South Africa have stressed that they are impatient with political bickering and the endless blame game amongst politicians and political parties. They want us to put their needs and aspirations first and they want us to work together for the sake of our country. Voters punished the ANC for its record on issues including the economy, crime, power cuts and corruption. The ANC remains South Africa's largest party, followed by the pro-business Democratic Alliance, which has joined it in government. It's a critic of the ANC's record in office and a party that has struggled to shake its image as a defender of white privilege. Investors have welcomed the inclusion of the DA, which wants to boost growth through structural reforms and prudent fiscal programs. Analysts, however, have warned that sharp ideological differences could make the government unstable. Relatives of the victims of two fatal Boeing 737 MAX crashes asked the US Justice Department to seek a fine against the plane maker of up to 24.78 billion US dollars and move forward with the criminal prosecution. A lawyer for the family said the amount was justified, saying Boeing was guilty of the deadliest corporate crime in US history. Earlier in the week, the families had gathered at Congress as company chief Dave Calhoun was grilled over the incidents. They weren't mollified by his show of contrition. I would like to apologize on behalf of all of our Boeing associates spread throughout the world, past and present, for your losses. Calhoun said Boeing took responsibility for the crashes, which were traced to a design flaw. But the families say the aerospace giant neglected known safety issues and must face prosecution. Strengthening the safety of the flying public is important, but there needs to be criminal charges for the people at the top, the people in the driver's seat who were responsible for, uh, for, for 346 deaths, including that of my sister in every single face that you see here. After the crashes in 2018 and 2019, Boeing agreed to a deferred prosecution deal with the DOJ, shielding it from criminal charges if it promised to improve its compliance program. However, the department last month concluded that the firm had not honoured all terms of the deal, something Boeing denies. Prosecutors now have until early July to decide whether to press ahead with a criminal case. They could also negotiate a plea deal with Boeing or extend the deferred prosecution agreement. Time for a short commercial break. More world news coming on the other side. Welcome back. Once driven to extinction in Europe's waters during the mid-20th century due to intensive fishing and declining water quality, the majestic Atlantean sturgeon is making a return. Thanks to a grant from European Wildlife Comeback Fund, a visionary initiative has marked a historic milestone with the reintroduction of this keystone species into a Swedish river for its very first time. This effort not only promises to revive a once lost icon but also heralds a brighter future for biodiversity in the European waters. 
Researchers hope these young Atlantic sturgeon will help bring the species back to Swedish waters, after they died out in the region nearly 100 years ago. Already years in the making, the team behind the Return of the Sturgeon project knows re-establishing the population could take longer than their lifetimes. Biologist Dan Calderon and project leader Linnea Jagrid are part of the team reintroducing young Atlantic sturgeon to Sweden's Jota Alf River. Until the end of the 19th century, there were spawning populations of Atlantic sturgeon in Jota Alf. The species died out in the region mainly due to heavy fishing and deteriorating water quality. According to the return of the sturgeon project, the water quality today is much better, and the conditions are just right for the species to spawn in the river. Over 100 sturgeon were brought from a German breeding facility to Sweden for release. Those tags allow researchers to track the movement of the sturgeons with acoustic telemetry, and the data will offer insights such as where the sturgeons feed. Rewilding Europe, a non-profit dedicated to bringing back endangered species, provided a grant for the project. Some of the young sturgeons were released in the Jota Al River on June 18th. Well, with that, we come to the end of World News tonight. We'll see you again tomorrow with more updates from across the globe. Well, stay tuned as Sina Mayadune will join you next with the Nightly Business Report. Thank you and have a good night.